Alex Miller from BHA. We have Danielle uh, from Kindling, a fire safety engineer. We have Kay, uh, who's a shelter officer with UNHCR. We have Ava, who is shelter cluster coordinator uh, for Northern re region of Mozambique. And we have Joe, who is a shelter and wash program manager, all talking about how they've contributed and engaged and support this interagency uh, project, shelter projects, uh, the publication which we are now launching. Without further ado, I will pass over to Brett Moore, the Global Shelter Cluster Coordination Coordinator from UNHCR. Brett, over to you. Thanks very much, Joseph. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Uh, very good. If it cuts out, I'll just turn off the video. I'm ap apologies, everyone. I'm in a, in a location with a poor signal. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to just provide some really short remarks um, to open uh, the meeting and launch the new Shelter Projects 8th edition. So, we you know, we've been going on since 2008. It's a wonderful publication that's really gone from strength to strength. Um, in this edition, you know, we've got a, a vast array of contexts, um, different kinds of shelter projects across different countries. So there's a lot of diversity represented within the case studies compiled. Um, and there's more than 300 or so um, studies so far. So between that, covering 70 countries, we've got a really good breadth of coverage. It's a really valuable resource. And now that we're investing more um, resources from the cluster in terms of research. We've got, you know, some very interesting um, op opportunities here for longitudinal studies and other kinds of processes. And, you know, you can really see this edition and the previous one um, going from strength to strength with some high academic rigor. So we're, we're really pleased and proud and thankful for IOM for shepherding the process and very much for Laura Haykoop who um, took the reins and kept everyone working well together on this. Uh, I think also the different products that have emerged over the last couple of years as well, the regional products, the um, thematic products are really valuable addition as well. So for those people that haven't yet perused, please do take the opportunity to do so. Last but not least, I'd also want to mention that this uh, edition is dedicated to the memory of our dear colleague, Petra was working with the cluster and she worked with us there for several years. Petra said Petra just over a month ago. And many of you knew her well. So this is a really fine dedication to the memory of Petra. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for organising the event, Joseph. And I'll hand over now to Alex from BHA for the, for, uh, as the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. And thank you all for joining this event. I can't say how proud we are at BHA for this type of accomplishment. This really presents our partners, the stakeholders, the world really, with evidence-based, peer-reviewed, and uh, positive outcomes from what Shelter Cluster, as well as other actors in the field have been doing. We continually go back to and reference uh, the Shelter Projects year after year for additional arguments for good projects, for good outcomes on how to do things. This is a, a great learning tool for uh, staff members in BHA and USAID as well, uh, and we use this continually to bolster what the Shelter Cluster does year after year, as well as make sure that we indeed do uh, look upon ourselves as uh, co-leaders, as well as the, the support of national actors, as well as the localization of many initiatives. Uh, we def definitely appreciate what uh, our, our colleagues uh, who have put this together have done, and we continually look forward to doing this year after year. We have no intention of stopping. And as of yet, uh, we have uh, continually shared uh, this year's, hopefully there are many uh, BHA colleagues on the, on the call today, but we've shared this uh, event with them and, and we really um, we really steer uh, evidence-based, uh, practitioner-based uh, awards and actions in the field uh, against other sectors in BHA. And so very proud, very proud, and we're very happy to share this with many others. And we definitely want to see this shared with uh, the greater world and to make sure that indeed this is not just a... Uh, a great little gem in a niche, but indeed a, a larger uh, span of communication can be applied to it. So, uh, so thank you very much for having this this launch as well as this project, and and this is definitely the beginning of many, many, many more years. So, thank you again, and, and uh, Joseph, I'll hand it over to you. 
Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Brett. I'm just going to remind you all that this is being recorded. I uh, hope that's acceptable for you. Um, just to say, maybe I'm not going to go into depth what Shelter Project is. Most of you are here, so I assume you know. If you don't, please contact, I think, anyone on the call or myself, and we'll happily provide more background. Um, I think what's interesting is what's different about this edition. Um, I really have to thank uh, Laura Haycoop for a lot of her work uh, on putting this together, but also not her, just her and the many of you who've contributed on the steering committee, on the panel, uh, and many of you on the call who've contributed content and case studies. I think what's interesting this year is we see much stronger analysis, so I'd like to sort of thank uh, Charles Parrock here on, on the call, and I'm sure he can provide more background on how we've done that. So the analysis, I think, at the front is stronger than it's been in the past. And we also see the return of opinion pieces, which I think are really interesting statements and positions. And if you follow them over the editions, what's evolved uh, in shelter sector and shelter sector thinking over time. So without over further ado, I'm going to pass you to the first uh, panelist who will talk about a case study. I'm going to introduce you to uh, Danielle. Uh, Danielle is a fire industry, fire safety engineer. I was joking at the beginning, everyone on the panel is architects. It's not actually true. Um, Danielle is a proud engineer uh, and a founder of uh, an executive director of Kingling, which is a non-profit organization uh, dedicated to connecting fire knowledge with local uh, global humanitarian de development uh, efforts. And Danielle has been doing a lot of work on the awareness on fire safety uh, recently. Uh, she's currently leading a global shelter cluster research project to explore and report on the current state of fire safety and humanitarian shelter and settlements. Uh, again, thanks to the support of BHO uh, and FCDO. So I'll pass without further ado over to Danielle. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph, and the wider shelter team or shelter projects team for the opportunity to be a panelist today and to share our thoughts and the opinion piece on fire and humanitarian shelter and settlements as part of the eighth edition. Um, we're quite excited. So I also want to thank my co-authors, uh, Phil Deloy, Jim Kennedy, and Liz Palmer for their collaboration developing the piece. I think they're also in the chat, so you can also reach out and say hi to them. Um, so fire is a daily risk for millions of people living in humanitarian settlements around the world. This is due to the combustible nature of commonly used shelter materials, the methods and fuels using cooking, heating and lighting and the densely built nature of many sites among other factors. And fire is a recurring hazard in the Rohingya camps in Cox's Bazaar, for example. Um, in March this year, you likely heard one of the largest and most high profile fires ever in humanitarian settlement took place. Um, this fire killed at least 11 people, injured another 560 and displaced over 45,000 people. Um, and the fire's consequences went way beyond deaths, injuries, and physical damages. It impacted affected populations' mental health and psychological well-being, relationships between refugees and host communities, agencies' ability to provide immediate long-term assistance, and, and much more. And it really highlighted just how devastating fire can be. And uncontrolled fires regularly undermine humanitarian assistance, leading to significant devastation to residents, the environment, and budgets and programming. Ultimately, fire safety is a matter of protection and accountability to affected populations. Next slide, please. But fire safety has fallen through the cracks of the cluster approach. It is so cross-cutting that it is everyone's and therefore no one's responsibility. The resources and approaches that currently exist are either too vague, too lax, too context specific, or too specific to the global north. And evidence gathering and coordination between agencies, clusters, affected communities, and local government is urgently needed, including expert informed scalable guidance and tools that are specific to the humanitarian sector. And while fire safety or specific guidance and tools are important, integration of fire safety into existing humanitarian policies and practices is even more important. Fire safety needs to be institutionalized into the ways things are done across the sector. With the support of the Global Shelter Cluster and funding from USA, BHA, and FCDO, we're now carrying out a baseline review on the current state of fire safety in humanitarian shelter and settlements. An important part of this project is engaging with humanitarian practitioners and researchers about their past experiences, knowledges, practices, and perspectives related to fire and fire safety. Um, so if you'd like to support this effort, and we hope you do want to, then please use this QR code. I'll also drop the link in the chat um, to fill out a five-minute survey 
um, to share your opinion and your experience. And you can also express interest in being interviewed or participating in a focus group as part of the project. Um, so yeah, thank you very much again for your time and attention and hope to talk to you all soon more. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, please everyone post any questions you have as we go along and we will be having Q&A and hopefully discussion at the end. Uh, my next or our next guest who I'm very pleased to be welcoming is uh, Kay. Kay is a, is a shelter officer with UNHCR Somalia at the moment. Um, she comes from Uganda and has a degree in architecture from Makerere University um, Kampala, an MSc in town planning and architecture from uh, Politecnico di Milano, uh, and a PhD in original, urban, regional and landscape planning from the University of Florence. So um, I'm a bit honoured to have you here, <laughs> Kay. You're far more qualified than I know I ever will be. Um, and also she's provided a really interesting uh, case study, which she will be talking a bit about now. Um, after her studies, she worked with the UNHCR settlement planning in BDBD uh, before moving to UNHCR headquarters, where she provided support on remote settlement planning support. Anyway, please, Kay, I'll pass, without further ado, I'll pass over to you. Sorry. Thank you. We can see you. We're good. I have a bit of a bad net. OK, good. So I have a bit of a bad network, but I hope I will be able to finish in time before it gets off. So first, I'd like to say thanks to IOM and the entire team for this great work. And also thanks to my team at HQ for what they're doing with this particular approach to settlement planning. Um, the case study was focused on steps taken during an emergency response to uh, a conflict in Darfur region that escalated in December 2019, requiring the establishment of a new settlement. So it was based on an integrated settlement planning framework that establishes a holistic response aligned to national, subnational, and local development plans with the aim of facilitating linkages between multi-sectoral humanitarian responses and long-term development efforts. So the new settlement, which is uh, Kushangin Mora, as you can see in red there, is strategically located to create opportunities for integration with host communities along the main highway from Abeshe town, which is one of the major towns in Chad in that region, and the border town of Adre that connects to Sudan. And the total population of that area before the new settlement was established was at around 8,000 people, more or less. And it comprised mainly pastoralists, agriculturalists, and seminomadic groups. So a key part of the planning process was the assessments using tools that like uh, the site assessment template that we've developed. And this was carried out by a joint multifunctional team consisting of representation from the government, local host communities, protection and technical teams that were on ground, because at that time there was no settlement planning support on ground. But the technical team at HQ was able to provide remote support as deployment was considered. Then eventually we also had remotely done assessments with uh, support from UNOSAT using satellite imagery for hydrology technology, settlement planning, uh, settlement patterns analysis, and also uh, topography, which was very helpful because when the technical team was on ground, a lot of the studies had already been done and it was a matter of verification and fact finding. Other assessments that were done by the team on ground when they got there was what we call the NEET, which is a Nexus Environment Assessment Screening that was done in view of the fact that we did not have time to do a complete environment impact assessment, given the scale of the emergency and the limited capacity on ground of not only our environment team, but the local environment authorities as well. So with this tool, we were able to get some recommendations that were adopted by not just us, but the local government as well for the establishment of the new settlement. So all these assessments and analysis was used in site planning and location of services, 
as well as phasing of growth to ensure that basic services and access to livelihoods and long-term development goals were achieved. I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay. So when we look at of the project, um, one of the key strengths was the strong multi-sectoral collaboration throughout the process and meaningful participation of both displaced and host communities in the decision making and planning process. Then we had active engagement of the local government and their technical teams, which ensured steps towards long term uh, planning for the settlement in alignment with their plans for the area. Then the weaknesses, I would say we had limited access to agricultural land. Given the context, it's quite common for not just the refugees that were bringing in, but the existing host communities as well. So this was partially addressed through continuous engagement with the livelihood colleagues to look for alternatives, like supporting them with uh, supporting the development of the local animal husbandry sector and other challenges like the ideal settlement location, this the existing services in more this affected a lot of our planning processes but we were able to mitigate by trying to find a middle ground uh, we also had host community involvement in the construction process was limited during the initial stages due to their lack of capacity, but gradually this was addressed through apprenticeship programs by hiring the local labor into the construction processes. And by that time we were leaving the mission, a great number of the host communities were already involved in that process. Uh, a key issue in this particular case study were HLP concerns that arose due to lack of participation of site boundaries. Uh, uh. I hope we can we still have you. Hear you. You're still there. Ah, okay, great. Yes, our uh, internet in Kampala is shady. But then, uh, yes, so we were able to address those HLP issues through continuous meetings and engagement, as you can see in that photo below, with the different stakeholders. A uh, particular lesson learned in this case study, I would say that uh, that uh, contingency planning should include more technical expertise in the decisions on whether new settlements should be opened and also on their location. Uh, settlement planning expertise should be engaged as early as possible in the process to ensure proper assessments are carried out and that HLP issues are adequately raised and addressed. Thank you. Looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, Kay, and uh, thank you to the Kampala inter Internet. That was very clear. Um, please yeah, stay with us. And if anyone has any questions, please uh, type them in the chat and we will have a hopefully have a bit of a conversation at the end. Our next presenter is uh, Eva Samalea. Eva's uh, another architect. Uh, and she's also a strong advocate for bamboo. So if anyone wants to know about bamboo or is interested in bamboo, please uh, have a conversation with Eva, who's very uh, enthusiastic and knowledgeable about it. Uh, she's worked in uh, shelter and wash sectors for over six years in Sierra Leone, South Sudan, DRC, uh, uh, Spain uh, for the COVID response and Mozambique, uh, where she is now working as shelter cluster coordinator for more than Mozambique. So I will pass you over to Eva. Thank you very much, Joseph, and, and thanks for all the shelter projects behind this amazing uh, eighth edition. It looks great. So um, I'm going to briefly, um, I know that most of you may, may have been familiarized with the, the, the complex crisis that is happening in Mozambique, but I'm going to give you an overview to understand to go, what has happened from 2020 to 2021, where we are now. 
So in the in 2019, uh, if you remember well, uh, Mozambique was hit by two cyclones, Cyclone Idai and Cyclone Kenneth. And me, by mid of um, 2020, and actually still now, there are still some uh, some it's the early some of the um, some of the activities from the response for Kenneth and Idai are still ongoing, especially in Kenneth in the northern region. And uh, so there are residual needs still. And by mid-2020, uh, the insecurity crisis exacerbated in the northern region. So uh, the, the, the movement of population, the displaced population increased in the, area, in the surrounding areas of Pemba in the southern districts. Then um, up to March, you can, find, you can see that the, the number of, um, of, ID, of people displaced increased up to 732,000. 227 individuals, but after that, the event in Palma happened. This was March 2021, when the situation, the, the number of displaced people has uh, been increasing every week. And right now, we don't have the numbers from round 13 DTM, but it's going to be public uh, very, very soon. Next slide, please. So, considering this situation, uh, let's go back to 2020 when we started with this um this uh, the, the situation was getting worse every day and the limit the resources were extremely limited in terms of human resources and also materials in terms of human resources the number of partners were very limited small teams and most of them were coming from the development sector so the change of mindset needed to come immediately and nobody was ready to this switch when they were still focused on the early recovery uh, from the for, from the cyclone Kenneth, then um, also the the limited ma the, the the issues with access to materials and the issues with the international procurement affected the response. Uh, actually, still some some items are uh, stuck for four five months in the and with due to all the procedures. So this was a main challenge and this affected the entire response. As you can see now, still the situation has increased due to, uh, we are happy to, to start receiving more, more support. And right now our capacity to cover is 73,000 in emergency shelter and uh, 71,000 in MFI. This is the capacity, but what has been reached is uh, just a little portion, as you can see in emergency shelter up to July. Uh, we we were uh, we managed to reach uh, 27,000 and 36,000 with NFIs. There are a lot of ongoing plan activities with the stock that is available and upcoming, but still it's not enough. And the rainy season is coming, cyclones is ongoing, so we need to be ready. And this is and also floods which happened last last year in in, in some of the temporary sites. So. Uh, considering all of this, we know that the need for, for prepositioning is is, uh, is huge, and so far we have been working on improvement of the pipeline system, and we happily we are glad to say that uh, at, up to now actually it is covering 30% uh, of the capacity to cover. So, next slide, please. Yeah, and despite all these uh, challenges, let's see some positive and, and beautiful um, uh, impact and lessons learned also. So uh, we need to reduce the, the quantity of items in, in the kits, etc. And, and our capacity to, to access, especially in terms of emergency shelter, was very limited. We need to limit it to just one tarp, which is extremely uh, difficult. But when you have this huge, this amount of uh, this, this Mm, these um, uh, huge needs and limited resources, we needed to, to optimize it as, as we could. So after that, um, considering all the challenges and how difficult it was for us to give this small kit, we definitely we suddenly uh, saw that the coping mechanisms of the of the affected population and their proactiveness was was amazing, and they were setting up houses and building immediately as soon as they received even just one with one tarp. We know that from there, we can support them with tools and then they can collect the materials. However, this also is something that uh, concerns the entire, uh, uh, on, I think that everyone in the response is the, the, the environmental impact uh, that this may, may have because the, the materials are not harvested properly. So now, considering all of these, all shelter cluster partners are thinking about this situation and 
uh, discussing different mechanisms and how we definitely need to reinforce our community mobilization activities, not just for the build back better um, um, practices, also for the environmental impact uh, awareness uh, issues, which uh, definitely need to be increased and maybe our focus should be there than more than, uh, uh, but due to the limited resources uh, in terms of um, human resources actually, uh, have been also com compromising this. But we are discussing about it and uh, next, next slide please. And then, uh, so with this case study, which is actually, I think that um, everyone that has um, prepared a case study of a response can, can say the same. It's, there is no report that can give you the same overview, the same type of overview that uh, this type of uh, case studies, where you go through all the all the issues, but also to um, focus on the on the lessons learned. And it's really um, for me this opportunity in certain project has been a huge, a, a great uh, document and a great a, a great support to also discuss in, in further with uh, that. Well, we are going to start discussing this in tomorrow, actually, to discuss with partners out. OK, so with this document, so where we can see where we were, where we are and where we should go. And now for the considering that we are starting the HNO and HRP uh, for 2022, this is going to be a key document. And also we discuss with RC and OCH about all the challenges and need. And this document definitely is a very good overview for them and very good document for them to understand what we are talking about. And the same with local authorities, which uh, uh, if when, when it's possible, I think that we can actually share this document and they can see and then we can and discuss together what type of support they require from us and what type of support we, we require from them. So that can be a, a great, uh, that, that's going to be a great support. And the same with donors, which I think that it's a, a great way to, to show the challenges, needs and priorities on the way forward. And then also with other experts, uh, as you all, to analyze the situation and think together and, and decide how we can and, and see how we can improve our response. So I, I hope that this, with this information, I have picked your brains and then we can discuss further in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Eva. Uh, our next uh, and final speaker is uh, Joe. Joe is the Shelter and Wash Program Manager with Solidarité International, International uh, in Lebanon. Um, he's got over eight years experience in the humanitarian field, particularly in shelter and wash, uh, and has also worked in cash landed world programs, contractor led programs uh, and beneficiary led programs. So he has a broad diversity of uh, practical and operational experience. And now he's running a two million euro ECHO funded project. Um, on emergency response and shelter interventions. So without further ado, I will pass you over to our fourth uh, case study speaker, Joe. Hello, first, thank you for giving me a chance to uh, to be part of this meeting and to represent Solidarity International. Uh, I'm going to go uh, through the approach that, that we've been using for the last four years. Uh, in the beginning, as a context, just for uh, just so that everyone would know, it's been like uh, more than 10 years since the Syrian crisis has started. Lebanon hosts approximately 1.5 million refugees, 58% uh, of which have uh, sheltered needs as they are overcrowded, substandard, at, and that privacy and security risks. Uh, the focus from from uh, informal settlements to SSBs was done in the last four years where protection risks were considered as the main uh, entry point. Solidarity International developed the protection driven approach due to the high needs for shelter related services, keeping in mind that it was the least funded sector. The need to find uh, a way to cover the most vulnerable beneficiaries while uh, not having the ability to cover all of them led us to initiate the communication with protection partners to create this approach. Uh, if we can please just move to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so meetings were held with uh, uh, protection working groups to set the main points to be tackled in our intervention, identify the main profiles that we need to be uh, following up on, namely the women, elderly, child at risk, people with disabilities and GBV survivors, 
and to clarify the main risks the refugees are facing. Uh, this project has been continuously evaluated uh, to ensure the approach and uh, led to having better communication and coordination with protection partners, especially that Solidarity at first was the only uh, organization going through this uh, approach and then slowly everyone was starting to, to, uh, to, to like get some bits of it in their own program. Uh, in addition, uh, MOUs were signed to guarantee continuous info and referral flow as it was uh, also the main point for us to, to, to get any referrals for those people uh, in HAR. Uh, so uh, with time, continuous coordination led to having, uh, led to working together with more than 20 and, uh, local and international protection uh, partners during uh, this time. Uh, as for challenges faced with, for this approach, uh, we've had like a low number of beneficiaries who were uh, identified initially uh, due to the full reliance on referrals from protection partner and then later on we had the, the Beirut blast explosion which even made the situation worse than Lebanon. Uh, that also led to increasing uh, social tension between refugees and host communities. In addition uh, to all the, uh, the issues that we had to adhere with, especially with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, as outcomes, uh, also please if you can move to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, we have 70% of households reported that the risk of falling ill was reduced due to the implementation of our program. 65% of beneficiaries who had their privacy improved and 20% stated that their protection from sexual abuse has had improved. 87% of the interviewed beneficiaries declared that this intervention improved their life, minimizing the risks associated with worrying about daily uh, life needs and most respondents reported that there was a noticeable positive uh, psychological effect. Half of the beneficiaries reported feeling better in their shelter and believe that their relationship with their neighbors improved. And more than 80% of landlords have even uh, respected the agreement uh, entailed in the pre-rehabilitation uh, MOU. The strength uh, of a similar uh, project uh, is that it was tailor-made project. Uh, taking into consideration uh, two examples, the first one was the implementation of a video phone for a disabled person who was able to, to view whomever is going to be visiting her and the ability to open and close the doors. Another one, for example, was the replacement of a, a normal Western seat with a wooden fabricated with metal structure, uh, having movable handrail and self ablution hole to support to, to support the elderly with, with their uh, mobility, especially that they want to be uh, more self-reliant. The strong links with protection actors supported targeting and enabled rehabilitation interventions to be tailored to beneficiaries' specific vulnerabilities. Uh, the satisfaction of the beneficiaries with the quality of rehabilitation has been high. The wider impacts of the rehabilitation intervention were measured and emphasized uh, as the project had a strong focus on the uh, tenure of security. As for the weaknesses, the vulnerable host communities have been so far uh, targeted only indirectly. Rent negotiation as a standalone tenure uh, security measure has limitation in an environment characterized by a severe financial crisis and loss of purchasing power. And further outreach and relationship building with protection uh, actors is constantly needed. As for the lessons learned, uh, we've been creating an institu institutionalizing relationship with protection uh, actors, further actions needed to improve uh, tenure security, reinforcing protection awareness within the shelter team is fundamental uh, as the sensitization of the teams to know how to address those people. Rehabilitation works and repairs at community level contribute to the reinforcement of social cohesion between refugees and host communities. And this approach has a direct impact on the increase of resilience, yet uh, a longer uh, term funding strategy is paramount to increase the sustainability. Uh, that's in brief, in brief the presentation that we have for the Shelter Watch for Protection. Uh, thanks again, and I'm ready to answer all the related questions. Over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, um, Joe. There must be some questions among you. 
Um, and whilst you're typing them down, I'm just going to take the advanced chance to pass over to Charles, who was looking at some of the uh, meta-analysis uh, done, or he tried to review what what the kind of recurring themes and meta of the case studies were. So, Charles, over to you. Great, this is Charles thanks, Parrott, Joseph. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, Charles Parrott here from Centre for Development and Emergency Practice at Oxford Brooks University. For two years now in the shelter, or two editions, sorry, I should say, in the shelter projects, we've been looking at some of the themes, trying to look at some patterns and look at some connections between the themes that people identify as strengths and weaknesses. And uh, thanks to Alex Miller, of course, for, for, for recognising the, the effectiveness of shelter projects in terms of evidence, in terms of gathering evidence, in terms of then applying that evidence to the policy development and to development of program um, level uh, uh, practices in, in order to be able to uh, influence the, the direction of shelter in terms of what works. So how do we know what works in shelter? Well, the, the, the way to do that is gather good evidence. Um, and, and that evidence, of course, then can be discussed with, with donors and with, with, uh, with, with shelter policy makers and, and, and to be able to get shelter discussed in those wider humanitarian or development or nexus uh, conversations and and also to to, to recognise the global shelter clusters um, initiatives in this area to to um, to be able to appoint global focal points for both evidence and advocacy uh, is is I think we have a really strong connection here in shelter projects with with the work of those global focal points to be able to craft some messages and then discuss what uh, what uh, further research. Um, uh, interests or, or, or questions this can raise, and then also to be able to work on advocacy points to be able to to um, to be able to support those advocacy advocacy points with really good evidence. Um, so, I mean, just to let you know the kind of headlines. I mean, I'm sure you've read them for yourself, but there are there are two two things that came up from the evidence, um, which were um, which were, which were firstly the linkage between host community support and social cohesion. This came through very strongly in a number of the case studies, and it's not something that we've particularly investigated um, within shelter programs, uh, but that it was really worth investigating further and to see whether how how far shelter projects can go in having an impact in social cohesion. It was shown in the case studies that support to host families and host communities, for example, building community infrastructure, completing unfinished buildings, including local authorities, had an effect on social cohesion between displaced and host communities. That's an emerging theme. A more known issue that came up in the program, in the in the case studies, is, is that cash for rent programs have negative effects on security of tenure if there's no exit strategy. It's gathering more evidence about that, but we know that's a known issue and and there have been recent guidelines on on that specific issue. But uh, just to, just finally, the, the top three, three strengths overall from our investigation of the themes were integrated programming, uh, and including multi sectoral approaches, social cohesion and resilience, and then local authority and government engagement. And a very last point, uh, it's we've got an initiative now within shelter projects to be able to uh, to propose some more longer term impact studies. We, we think there's a very good case to be able to say, well, these are these case studies are uh, time limited because of the, the humanitarian intervention. But it would be really amazing to look over a longer time scale about, for example, social cohesion and see what the effects of shelter programs have been over a longer term in, in something. Um, something like shelter, uh, social cohesion or, or, or other kind of long term or wider impact issues and wider impact is, of course, one of the key themes of the of the global shelter cluster strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, and I'm sure there must be some questions uh, or comments among the large audience here. Um, in the meantime, I have two questions for the panelists. One is how can we use the learnings from your case studies? Uh, best in the future? So how can we best take on them and use them? And uh, secondly, how can we help people learn, which is a similar kind of question, is how can we help people learn uh, from good practices, but also help them learn from some of the mistakes that have been made in the past? I don't know if any of the panellists would like to pick that up.
or I can pass to a panelist. Maybe I will pass over. I don't know. Um, Danielle, you went you went first on this, um, and I guess this is close to <laughs> improving improving practices in relation to, relation to fire. Yeah, what sorry, I was trying to problems? find the button. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, hopefully the this opinion piece on fire can help to kind of catalyze a much bigger conversation about fire safety. Um, I think me and the other co-authors have been poking around in events the past couple of years, trying to kind of raise awareness of the issues. But really what we're trying to do with this case study is to lay out what some of the key challenges are and start to identify ways that we can move forward collectively around fire safety improvements. Um, the case study itself or the, the opinion piece itself doesn't give insights from one particular place, but rather try to look at the overall kind of landscape around fire safety. Um, and so now as you know, we're as we mentioned, we're kind of going forward with research, but really it's intended to get people to engage around the issue and to start sharing practices because there's a lot of knowledge actually that's quite um, it's quite isolated and kind of context specific and you kind of have to go seek people out to find out what they've done in the past and what good practices look like and that's not being shared very well across other contexts and kind of it's not supporting coordination across the sector and in specific contexts more generally um, and so really the, the hope with this opinion piece is to start figuring out how we can link people together and start to create a community of practice around fire safety. So it's, it's more of a call to action, I suppose, than, um, than something that has key learning that gives the solution of how to go forward. Hopefully we can kind of collectively work on, on those approaches together and, and try to create good practices that can be institutionalized across the sector. Thank you. And I'm Kay, I hope you don't mind, and I hope the Kampalan internet is still up to speed. Um, but maybe I can ask you the same questions, is how can, I mean, I think it was interesting the work you were promoting on kind of a broader approaches to, to settlement planning. But how do you think we can learn from this case, the case, the, your case study? Um, well, thank you very much for that question. Um, I would say that the work we are still doing is still a work in progress. So this case study, in a way, is a pilot. So we learn from what we are doing and then it informs for that the ongoing work on what we are doing with integrated settlement planning but yes the learning that we could say is with such work we are bringing out the questions on how do we continue to plan settlements in isolation as technical people yet it's a much more broader sector i would say we should be beginning to talk more with our colleagues outside through a multi-sectoral perspective. So I would say that such a platform would give us an opportunity to raise these questions on how do we begin to get engaged with other people, how do we begin to engage with local authorities more with our protection, let's say our community-based people with more knowledge in community-based approaches and things like that, because it goes beyond the technical aspects as we know as architects or engineers on how to plan a settlement. Because for to, to for us to begin to affect long-term aspects, we need to think beyond what we are doing now. So I guess the lessons learned from my case study in particular is uh, how multi-sector engagement from a more practical sense. And yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe I can ask the same question again uh, in turn to uh, Eva and to to Joe. I mean, Eva, you discussed it a bit already, but. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think that that's from this case study what we're still learning and there are so many lessons learned for all of us working on the response, but I think that uh, some of the key lessons that we are and we are noticing is uh, about how sometimes it's not focused on the materials that you provide. It's also uh, how it's that maybe we need to focus in other in other aspects because for me the key was the composition of the kit. It is yeah, it is below the standard. It's maybe one tarp is not enough, but actually maybe 
that in that way they they are building their their house and maybe what can be how we can help them with this with this modality maybe to get upgraded shelters in another in a different way and more sustainable in a more sustainable way because at the end we end up with seas of tarps and definitely tarps are important but for me it was very challenging to okay let's let's go for one tarp for for kid because per kid because we don't have more and, and we don't we cannot reach even a minimum part of the affected population but at the end we could see their coping mechanisms and we really uh, with this proactiveness it's uh, it's really uh, impressive how they with the minimum support you can help them and actually how you can support this coping mechanism maybe it's not about it's not about providing the materials and that's all it's and we need to be focused on as we know in the build back better principles but also this after that the other lessons is what about the environmental impact not just about the tarps but about the harvesting of the materials because we always say yeah well they they have tools and and they can go and collect the the, the woods or or the bamboo but how how can be harvested in a sustainable way so I think that this can be some of the of the learnings that can maybe uh, I hope that this will help more reflection around this and how to help people about learning from uh, to learn from these good practices and to avoid some of the, of the bigger mistakes. I think that is just about bringing these discussions to the table and discussing with everyone and involve more people and showing them the, these good practices and brainstorm together it's about empowering people to be part of this change that is not happening because we keep doing the same so it's just about um uh, awareness and mobilization mobilization from our side i think <laughs> thank you thank you uh and joe do you want to take the same question or do you want to take hilmi's uh, question so there's a question from joe would you like to take the same question as the other panelists well, I don't mind uh, replying to it. Also, I'd like okay. only to mention one key point, uh, which is extremely useful for us, uh, which is that we need to, to be reviewing the, the, the assessment uh, on a continuous basis. And it's based on the nature of the crisis that you are dealing with. Then you should know the, the nature of the approach that you should be working on. In Lebanon, we are working with a protracted Pro, uh, uh, protracted crisis eventually. The crisis first started with the influx of the refugees and then it, it got bigger bigger with the economic crisis that started in 2019 and then the Beirut blast. At the very beginning, uh, people were fine with uh, just being indirectly targeted uh, the host community. Then later on, due to the uh, financial issues, there was a need, as we have mentioned, that we will be including like people from the host community into this program itself. Definitely change in the, in the assessment and the material used is to be done. Dynamism in the program uh, is key to be able to, to, to like answer to all the needs done. Uh, in addition to that, focus group discussions and uh, actual needs of the uh, beneficiaries, uh, they need to be included in whatever uh, whatever project is to be uh, is to be implemented. I, I hope I'm I'm giving like uh, a good answer for the remaining participants or to help them a bit with this. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So a question from Hilmi is how effective and useful uh, the shelter project has been among local organisations, governments from the past, and how can we ensure that it's used and lessons are taken on by this larger group of stakeholders. Um, it's a challenge we've had is how do we talk beyond just the same people doing shelter each time. Um, so I don't know who would like to take this question on. Do we have any volunteers? Maybe I could ask Kay or, or Daniel. Um, yes, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to suggest um, maybe through our uh, technical working groups at the field level during the meetings we have with local authorities because they participate in these technical working groups, I assume. So from that level, it could become habit in that when we have humanitarian responses, humanitarian shelter working groups or shelter coordination groups, we can use these as tools to push out 
shelter projects for learning lessons as well. That's my suggestion. I don't know. If... Thank no, you. And I think that's good. I think one of the things we've tried to do and uh, we track hits as a result. So we know how many people uh, download is when an event happens. If we when we share copies, we can clearly see more people are downloading it. Um, Translating that into local authorities, I think, is a, a different a different challenge. And for that, I think we need to work as much on issues such as language. So we need to work harder on translation. Um, but we also need, obviously, people in the field to be taking it and showing it and using these as examples. But I'd be interested, um, <clears throat> Eva, Joe or Danielle, if you have any thoughts on this question. Hi Joe, I'm happy to add. Um, so suppose this is more general than just the shelter project specifically, but I think the spreading of knowledge and awareness around issues like, like fire safety or other cross-cutting issues is incredibly important. And within fire safety specifically, there's been very few assessments that are very holistic. So there's been six fire risk assessments by international experts, two in South Sudan, one in Lebanon, one in Bangladesh, one in Thailand, and one in Kenya. Um, the ones in Lebanon and Bangladesh have probably led to the most change locally. Um, and if we look at Lebanon more specifically, there has been kind of more institutionalization of fire safety or mainstreaming through a working group um, around fire safety and kind of physical and non-physical interventions that we can learn from. And those are kind of staying within that very specific context. And, you know, we talk about it a little bit, but there's not really an opportunity until now for us to talk about it on a wider stage and to be able to show that actually fire isn't just this really overwhelming thing that happens really quickly and then we need to focus on recovery. There's actually things we can do before an incident to try to prevent the incidents from happening and to actually reduce the risk of not just the fires happening, but also the consequences when they do. So protecting life, protecting property, et cetera. Um, so being able to have something in the Shelter Projects publication that talks about those context-specific learnings and starts to be able to uh, provide something that's reliable to bring to local actors in different countries as a really an advocacy piece and a way to start a conversation around the need to improve fire safety and the evidence uh, to start sharing the evidence that exists that actually you can make a positive difference. This isn't just something that's impossible to tackle, which I think is sometimes a prevailing thought because um, it can be a pretty overwhelming thing to, to take on. Um, so I think you know, there's not as many past pieces around fire safety. There's a few really interesting lessons learned from some past fires and shelter projects, which have certainly informed our thinking and the way that we talk about fire safety in our work, um, especially some of the historic fires that have been featured in shelter projects over the years. Um, and hopefully this piece will create a bigger platform for us to engage with local actors in different countries in the future. Thank you very much. So maybe if we can have the next slide. Um, I don't know if the panelists, have, any of the panelists kind of want to contribute anything just as we kind of come to a close. I mean, I think the important thing for, ah, Joe, please go ahead. Joe, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks again. Uh, well, to add on whatever just been said, also uh, we need to mention in Lebanon that we have been working a lot on the capacitation of the uh, capacity building of the of the local organizations in the country. This has been also <laughs> reflected in the Lebanon crisis response plan requested. This has given like a very good uh, advantage for us working. Then later on, as also it has been mentioned, we have started with, with the awareness sessions. The fire is an example of what we have done as awareness. And then we were looking into like providing additional material that could be used. It was split between informal settlements, SSB, whatever could be done. So this also uh, had played a very good uh, or like a very important role in the capacitation and capacity building of the local organizations, which have also helped a lot in the, in the implementation and the awareness raising of the of the local community. Thanks. Thank you very much. Something that came to my mind actually, boss, during your presentation, Joe, but also from Danielle, was that there are often issues such as disability inclusion, um, where we know they're addressed in programs, but they're not very well documented. So there are often things that staff have just done because, oh, I can just fix this. Sometimes they're standalone programs. And I thought your case study was really interesting that it showed how you kind of mainstream mainstreaming various forms of inclusion by kind of thinking about things and addressing a program holistically, but it's something that isn't doesn't always actually come out in a write-up, although we know a lot of 
people are doing it. So um, just, just to say it was very interesting and it's hard to find good examples of housing, land and property addressed in programmes or fire safety addressed in programmes or disability inclusion um, because it, people doing it often forget to talk about what they've done. So um, I think your case study does that does that well, shows how to mainstream those activities within within the response. Um, what I might do now is uh, close up this call. I'm sh it would be much more fun if we were face to face and we could then have a coffee break where I'm sure we would have many more discussions um, going forward. Just like to thank again all of the participants today. Uh, Brett, Alex, Danielle, Kay, Eva and Joe. Um, there is Colin in the chat, a thanks to Laura, but also the hidden uh, warriors behind Shelter uh, Projects. Um, I've given a long list of thanks above, but also people like Elisa, who's driving the slides, who's done a lot of the work, uh, and Pfizer from the team who did a lot of work in putting it together. Thanks to IFRC who are doing printing. Uh, there'll be a print uh, run so you can be able to get uh, copies. We'll be sending copies out to agencies. So if you want a copy, please contact us will do it probably one shipment per agency rather than individually as the logistics is a bit tricky uh, and expensive but if you want hard copies please please contact to us and thanks a million to everyone for all of their hard work in getting to this edition shelter project eight um and dare i say it looking forward to what shelter projects nine will bring although we have a bit of a breather first and we have various things planned such as a video competition, such as more photo competitions before. Uh, we were even talking about a shelter project's messages uh, calendar. Uh, we have a lot of ideas which hopefully we'll be able to move on some and we'll keep you uh, in touch. So thanks so much to everyone and have an excellent day. And more importantly, have a really good read. Certainly uh, have a flick through the photos um, if that's if once you've picked the photos, then try and read as much as possible because there's some really amazing content uh, as these four presentations have shown. Thank you very much, everyone. And an applause to all. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Well done. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, lots.